Hi, thanks for joining us for our Wednesday evening Bible study at Family of God Community Church. Hi, thanks for joining us again at Family of God Community Church. We're looking at the Beatitudes that are found in Matthew chapter 5. Our series is called, Don't Worry, Be Happy. The reason being is that these Beatitudes always begin with the word, blessed. As a matter of fact, tonight's verse of scripture leads us into an understanding of how you and I can be blessed by developing controlled reactions to life. You know, I can't always control all of the circumstances and situations around us, but I can develop a controlled reaction to the life that takes place. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at verse 5. Verse 5 in this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5 begins, Blessed are the meek. Now, the word blessed, as we've said before, means to be filled with happiness and joy. And so the scripture tells us that we are to be blessed. And then it says, for they will inherit the earth. It doesn't say we have the earth right this minute, but it says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And in reality, this is one of those rare instances in the New Testament where you see a direct quotation from an Old Testament passage. Here it is in Psalm 37 and verse 11. Let's look at it in its proper context. The scripture here says, but the meek in the end, in other words, not right this moment, but in the end, they shall inherit the earth. And then it adds a little thing to it. It says, not only will they inherit the earth, which means it'll belong to them, it'll become theirs. The scripture says, but they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Without a doubt, right now, the world is not at peace, but yet, it is a spirit of meekness that will bring about that abundance of peace. It's not going to happen any other way. We've got to learn what meekness is and seek to understand it so that we can apply this in our lives. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's look, if we would, at clearing up a little bit of confusion about being meek. The Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest man on the earth. Now, Moses was trained in the Pharaoh's household. He had uh, a highly developed education system. He was taught to read and write probably in several different languages. He was trained in the art of warfare. And several times we see in the scriptures where he actually engaged and used those skills that he was able to ward off uh, throbbers and thieves, bullies. We see him at different times leading the nation of Israel in battle. How do you think those young men who had grown up doing nothing but being a slave, building things with their hands, how did they learn to be great warriors? Well, obviously someone had to teach them. And the one person with them that had tremendous skill in warfare and hand-to-hand -hand combat was Moses. And so we can 
probably understand that Moses passed on some of this ability with him. Understanding that he was a strong leader, he was highly educated, and that he was trained in the art of personal combat and warfare, you look at him and you say, how is this man meek? Well, that comes through an understanding of what meekness is and what it is not. First of all, meekness is not weakness. Some people think meek means that he's a milk toast, that you don't have any backbone, you don't have any strength, you don't stand up for anything. You just go along with things and you don't rock the boat. That is not the true definition of meekness because meekness is not weakness. As a matter of fact, meekness is strength under control. The word in the Greek literally means to be under control. It is a reference that is used with horses, as a matter of fact. How do you bring a powerful animal like a horse under control? How do you cause it to do what you want it to do? Well, the scripture teaches us, and historically we are taught, that you use a bit The scripture says you put a bit in a horse's mouth, you can turn it whithersoever you will. And so we look at this and we understand that this word meek is a direct reference to being able to control tremendous power. It is strength that is under control. When you look at Moses, he was a man who was meek. There were times when he could have taken situations and circumstances into his own hand, but the meekness of his spirit allowed him to pray first, allowed him to seek God's guidance and wisdom in the circumstances and situations that he found himself in as a leader of the nation of Israel. And so here we understand that this word linguistically, historically, and by example is strength under control. It is not a sense of weakness. It is a great word that means to have strength under control. So what I want to do so I want to talk to you a little bit about situations and circumstances in our life where we need to control our reactions to life. There are any number of situations that we find ourselves in that we need to display meekness. We need to be examples of what Jesus Christ tells us to be. He didn't give us these beatitudes just so that we uh, could have a nice little story to teach the children in Sunday school. He taught us this Beatitudes that we might truly develop these spiritual attitudes in our day-to-day life and thereby be blessed by them, thereby be happy, thereby have great joy in our day-to-day living in life. Not worrying so much about the moment, but looking to the future and understanding the great blessings that will come to us one day. And so what do I do in certain circumstances and situations? When do I need to control how I react to life? Let's look at just a few of these. First of all, when someone serves you, when someone serves us, we need to control our reactions. There are many situations and circumstances we are served. Sometimes we're served by people in our own family, they take care of us. They provide for us. We often take them for advan- ad- take, take them for granted is the word I'm trying to say. But we need to understand that when someone serves us, we need to demonstrate a spirit of meekness. Too many times you see situations and circumstances where there are bullies. I've been in restaurants where I've actually seen this take place, where someone is doing their very best to serve someone, and they are treated horribly. Not just by men, but by men and women. And that is a behavior that does not exemplify Jesus Christ. My wife and I friended a a young lady who is a waitress, and she told us in confidence that uh, many times uh, she noted that Christians would come in, and of course they'd bow their head and pray, and very often they were very rude, They did not treat her with any respect. There was nothing she could do that satisfied them in meeting their needs. She tried her best to serve them. But you and I need to understand that that type of behavior destroys our reputation and our witness for Christ. I hope that she saw in us something very different. When someone serves you, you need to demonstrate that spirit of meekness. As a matter of fact, 
You need to be understanding, not demanding. There are often situations and circumstances that you're unaware of that go on behind the scenes, and we need to be understanding and not demanding. Here in this passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is speaking to the church at Philippi, and he said this, Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interest, but also each for the interest of others. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. Jesus lowered himself a little lower than the angels and came to earth to be a man in order to set that example of humility and, and be the example in our lives. And you and I need to learn to esteem others and lift them up. Be understanding, not demanding. I looked up that word esteem in the Greek, and it's the word hegomai. And hegomai means to lead. In other words, we're setting the example. When you esteem someone, you're lifting them up. You are uh, being that leader. You're setting the example that you need to give to others. And so you and I need to esteem others. We need to be understanding and not demanding. So that's the first situation, when someone serves you. Now, how about this one? What about when someone disappoints you? <laughs> Ever been disappointed? We all have. As a matter of fact, you and I have disappointed others. And we have to look back on that and say, how did people respond when I disappointed them? We look at our lives and we realize that the circumstances and situations that we face are not unique just to us. As a matter of fact, everyone has the same experiences in life. And so as we learn to be meek, we need to develop that mentality that says, when someone serves me, I need to be understanding. I don't need to be demanding about what I want and what my rights are. I need to be understanding because they're serving me. They're helping me. They're providing for me. And then secondly, when someone disappoints me, I need to be gentle, not judgmental. We are very quick to judge. Bam, just like that. We get upset. Uh, we are out there. We are, we are trying to get our rights taken care of. And we become judgmental immediately. But the scripture says we need to be gentle. It doesn't mean that we don't understand that we've been disappointed. What it does mean is that we display ourselves in such a way that we're gentle. Here in this passage of scripture, we see in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, the scripture says, welcome. That word welcome means to accept. Welcome those who are weak in faith. There are a lot of people that have different levels of spiritual maturity, and they have different levels of maturity in general. So the scripture says, welcome those who are weak in faith. That doesn't mean that, they're, um, that they uh, are stupid. I've heard people say that, weak in faith. That is not what this word means. This word means that they have not developed or learned or matured to the level that maybe someone else has. Well, the scripture says, welcome those who are weak in faith. Accept them just as they are. But here's the key. Do not argue with them about their personal opinions. That word opinions is a direct reference to speculations. In other words, it's not necessarily based on that which is true, but everyone develops their own personal opinions. They, they speculate about what may be true or what may not be true. And as a result, they have these opinions and these ideas. And the scripture says, when we're disappointed, just accept people the way they are. And when you begin to do that, do not get in an argument with them. Sometimes when we're disappointed, the first thing we want to do is create and start a big argument. Uh, as a pastor, I've seen this in counseling situations where there's conflict between individuals, whether they're husband and wife or two individuals or others. They develop this mentality that is very judgmental toward the other person. And there's no spirit of gentleness in them. And I think that's where this comes in. 
In this passage in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, uh, Paul again teaching, he says, Dear brothers, if a Christian is overcome by some sin, in other words, they've disappointed you, you who are godly should gently. You see, there's the key. Be gentle, not judgmental. You who are godly should gently and humbly put him back on the right path, remembering that next time it might be one of you who is wrong. Share each other's troubles and problems, and so obey our Lord's command. If anyone thinks he is too great to stoop to this, he's fooling himself, and he is really a nobody. In other words, don't think you're so high and mighty and above everybody else and that you're never a disappointment, that you never fail, that you never sin. You're messed up. <laughs> don't think that way, the scripture says. We need to share each other's troubles and problems. As a matter of fact, nine times out of ten, when you jump to a conclusion and you want to judge someone, I guarantee you that in your life, at some time or another, you were in the same boat that they're in right now. And so we need to learn to follow what the Scripture says. Be gentle and humble and help them. We don't need to be judgmental. So when we are being served, we need to be understanding and not demanding. And when someone disappoints us, we need to be gentle and not judgmental. Here's a third time when we need to experience and to demonstrate meekness. When someone disagrees with you. Now, we all know that in America, everyone has the same ideas, the same opinions. Everyone is on the same page and agrees on everything, right? <laughs> Forget that. We have so much disagreement among us as Americans because we're free thinkers. And as a result of that, we have a lot of disagreement. Even in religious circles, there's a lot of disagreement about things. Well, the scripture says that we need to be meek even when someone disagrees with us. This is one of the greatest times where you and I can demonstrate the meekness that comes from knowing Jesus Christ and having a good attitude in situations and circumstances where we don't all think alike. We need to be tender without surrender. You see, the problem with most people is they think if you disagree with me, then uh, you have to come around to my thinking. Well, that's not true. I don't have to come around to someone else's opinions, ideas, speculations, or thoughts. You and I need to be tender toward those who disagree with us without surrender. I don't have to give up my faith. I don't have to give up my values. I don't have to give up my teaching and my truth in life. I don't have to give up my personal convictions, nor should I force anyone else to do so in their hearts and lives. We need to learn to be tender without surrender. That's an important statement. Let's say that together. You need to be tender without surrender. You and I need to take that to heart. We can be gentle and tender with someone without giving up our convictions and our beliefs. And I think that's important. Here in this passage of Scripture in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, it tells us a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Actually, in the context of the Hebrew, there are two words here for anger. The one means to be hot. That's that first one. A gentle answer quiets a hot temper, a hothead. You got somebody who's really hot about something, their opinion is greater than anyone else's, and they think if you uh, don't agree with them that you're wrong and I'm right, when in reality, the scripture says individuals who approach a circumstance or a situation and they're a hothead, you need to approach that with a gentle answer doesn't do any good to yell back. You've seen people get in a yelling match. That leads and escalates and just goes further. That's what the next element says. It says, but a harsh answer, a smart aleck answer, someone who pokes at a situation, they stir it up. That word it is the second word in the Hebrew for 
uh, anger, it means to flare the nostrils. It was a direct reference to bulls. You know how bulls, when they get upset, their nostrils just flare? Well, people are like that too. They get so upset. They're not just hot. Now they're ready to fight. Now they're ready to charge. And you've got to be careful in situations and circumstances like that. When someone disagrees with you, you need to give a gentle answer. You need to be tender without surrender and compromise on your beliefs. A gentle answer quiets, calms it down. But a harsh one, a misplaced word, will stir it up. Here's another passage. This passage is found in James chapter 3. The scripture says, and I love this translation, the message, it is uh, a presentation of the emotional elements in the Greek language. A lot of people don't understand the differences between translations, uh, and some people refer to this as uh, merely a paraphrase. But in reality, it is taking a passage of scripture and pulling together the elements that are found in the context of the original language and putting them into a vernacular that is easily understood by the hearers in the language that they actually use every day. And so we look at this and we understand that the message gives us a lot of the emotional elements that are found in the Greek language. Some translations are just word, 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 this one is not like that. That's the reason I like to use it sometimes, because it conveys the emotional element that is found in the passage. It says, whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throats. They've got wars and fightings. You're trying to be on top. You're trying to be number one. But they get at each other's throats. The scripture says, however, real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life. True wisdom, God's wisdom, comes from above and is founded in holiness and is characterized by getting along with others. We need to learn to get along, not constantly divide. We don't have to agree on everything, but we do need to be civil in our disagreements. Here it says, it is gentle and reasonable overflowing with mercy and blessings. What is gentle and reasonable? <laughs> wisdom. God's wisdom. Wisdom from above. Wisdom from heaven. It is gentle and reasonable. It is overflowing with mercy and blessings. I think one of the reasons that so many people don't look to the scriptures for insight and help and hope in different situations and circumstances is because they have a tendency to look at the scripture as being uh, angry, vindictive, uh, punitive by nature, but it's not. The scripture says the wisdom that comes from God is gentle and reasonable. It is overflowing with mercy and blessings, happiness. And you can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Now, Brother Phillips, when he did this, he, he put this together and he used these terms, dignity and honor. So I actually dug deep into the Greek to look at these aspects of dignity and honor and what they actually involved. And some of the things that I, that I saw in this concept of dignity and honor that they represented goodness. When we treat each other and we're good to one another, that's important. Secondly, mercy. Mercy is an important element in treating, treating people with dignity and honor. We not only need to treat them good, we need to be merciful to them. Uh, a third thing I looked up that I was as I was studying this in the original language, the references of dignity and honor also demonstrated a lack of partiality. In other words, I'm not favoring this person over this person. I'm not favoring this group of people over this group of people. Uh, and yet that is some of the conflict that we find ourselves in, especially in today's climate. And then lastly, uh, if you're going to treat people with dignity and honor, it has to be devoid of hypocrisy. And so you and I literally need to learn that when someone disagrees with us, 
We need to be tender. We need to have a gentle response. We need to be tender with them. But we do not need to surrender and become like them and believe like them. We need to stay true to what God teaches us to believe and be honorable unto Him. So, when someone serves us, we need to be understanding and not demanding. When someone disappoints us, we need to be gentle and not judgmental. And when someone disagrees with us, we need to be tender without surrender. Here's another situation. When someone corrects us. You know, when you're growing up as a child, we're often corrected. Sometimes our parents correct us. Sometimes our teachers correct us. Sometimes our grandparents correct us. And sometimes our friends correct us, you know, when you're young. But as we get older, we're less and less susceptible to correction because we think we've arrived. But in reality, all of us need to be corrected from time to time. And so we need to learn how to respond when someone corrects us. Someone points out something in our life that's not right. Well, when that happens, the scripture says we need to be teachable, not unreachable. The scripture often teaches us that we need to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit leads us to understand what the Holy Spirit reveals to us. And He does so not just with the Word of God, but sometimes He uses people of God to communicate truths to us. Sometimes He uses impressions in our life in order that we might truly understand and be teachable in those moments so that we can become exactly what God intended us to be. So we need to be teachable, not unreachable. Here in this passage in James chapter 1 and verse 19, the scripture says, In view of what he has made us then. See, God created us. He has made us. Dear brothers, he's talking to believers, let every man be quick to listen, but slow to use his tongue, and slow to you lose his temper. For man's temper, his anger, is never the means of, of achieving God's true goodness. God's righteousness is never demonstrated in anger. It's just not. And so when you and I have a situation where we're being corrected, your behavior is wrong, you should not be doing that. The scripture says, let us be quick to listen, but slow to use our tongue and to speak. Let us be slow to get angry and upset when someone confronts us and says, this is not right. Let us truly understand that when we get angry, we lose. When we get angry, it never demonstrates God's righteousness. It never helps us achieve God's true goodness in our life. I had a a gentleman years ago, he's now home with Jesus. He said, uh, when you're angry, you'll make the greatest speech that you ever regret. (laughs) And that is so true. So, when someone serves me, be understanding, not demanding. When someone disappoints me, I need to be gentle and not judgmental. When someone disagrees with us, we need to be tender without surrendering our convictions. When someone corrects us, we need to be teachable. Learn from it. Say, you know what, maybe you're right. Let me dwell on that. Let me pray about that. Let me ask God to teach me more and to show me and thank them for their correcting. That's one of the important things to remember in meekness in your life and in mine. And God wants us to be meek. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be happy in our day-to-day life. And He wants us to inherit the earth. The last situation that I'm going to share with you Uh, is probably the deepest emotional element. You and I need to demonstrate meekness when someone hurts us. When we are hurt deeply, emotionally, when someone hurts us, you and I need to be acting, not reacting. We need to be an actor, not a reactor. You don't need to immediately respond to that. You and I need to be proactive in everything that we do. 
So when you're hurt, stop just a minute. Don't just react. Meekness understands what it means to be hurt. And so when we are meek, it's not a matter of the fact that we're not hurt. It's how I control my reaction to that hurt. And so we need to be an actor. We need to be proactive, not reactive. Here in this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 12, it says, Never pay back evil for evil. When someone hurts you, does something to hurt you, you need to never try to seek revenge. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honest, clear through. Don't quarrel with anyone. It does not do any good to get in an argument with someone that has hurt you. You need to be at peace with everyone just as much as possible. I think it's interesting that Paul put that in there. There are some people you just cannot get along with completely, but you don't have to engage in argument with them. You can walk away. That doesn't mean that you're weak. That doesn't mean that you're a coward. I know uh, on the playground, if someone challenged you and you walk away from a fight, they all yell, coward, 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 coward. Matter of fact, I was quite the individual that got that every once in a while when I would do that simply because my name rhymed with it. Howard the Coward, that's what they called me sometimes until I punk punched a guy in the nose, which I am not very proud of. But nobody called me Howard the Coward after that. That wasn't the right response. That was not a meek response. The scripture says, never pay back evil for evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honest, clear through. In other words, be what Christ wants you to be. Don't quarrel with anyone. Be at peace with everyone just as much as possible. If it's possible, be at peace with them. If it's not, just walk away. Don't let evil get the upper hand. But conquer evil by doing that which is good. That word good in the Greek, agathos, means that we do the things that are right. We do the things that are good. We don't have to be bad. You don't combat evil with evil. You combat evil with goodness. You combat darkness with light. And so in the context of this, we need to remember when someone hurts us, let's be proactive. Let's not react to it. Here's another one. I love this passage in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32. It says, It is better to be patient than powerful. When someone hurts us, you're better off to step back and take a deep breath. I know it hurts. I know that your feelings were hurt terribly. I know that you think they may have done it on purpose, but the reality is a lot of times people hurt us and they never intended to. As a matter of fact, you have hurt people and you did not intend to in any way, shape, or form. And the only thing that you can do is be patient. Being patient is better than being powerful. It is better to win control over yourself, over your own emotions, over your own thoughts, than to win control over whole cities. The implication you could try to control every situation, circumstance, and environment that you're in, but it will never be as successful as controlling your own emotions. Learn to control your own self. It's better than anything else. It's better to be patient than powerful. The Bible tells us that we can do that. The Scripture says, For the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that God has given us, does not make us timid. Often that word timid is translated in the Greek as fear. God does not give us a spirit of fear. But timidity, we do not have to cower. Instead, the Bible tells us that you and I have the Holy Spirit and He fills us with three things. First of all, with power. The Holy Spirit gives us a full essence of His power. We are powerful we can do anything. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, that Holy Spirit, when He is in us, He gives us and fills us with His power. Second thing, He fills us with love. And so when we are hurt, we have the power of God on our side. We can do anything. We can be meek. Secondly, 
The Holy Spirit fills us with his love, which transcends any hurt that you and I might have. Love covers a multitude of sin, the scripture says. God's love is all accepting. And so the Holy Spirit fills us with power. He fills us with love. And then here's the third thing. He fills us with self-control. We do not have to be reactive in situations where we're hurt. We can be proactive. And that is important for us to understand and to learn. The Holy Spirit gives us these powers that we can use them in our lives. In closing, I want to leave you with a passage of Scripture. Again, from the Message Translation. This passage in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Let's see how he puts together. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. Meekness. That's the moment that you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You inherit the earth. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and watch you wherever you may go. And as you go through this week, remember to be meek. Remember to be blessed by God and you will inherit the earth. May God bless you. Dear friend, if you were watching tonight, and you don't know for certain if you died that you'd go to heaven, let me encourage you just to take a moment right now and just pray this prayer with me to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just say, Lord Jesus, I come before you and I ask forgiveness of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for me and that you were buried and that you rose again on the third day. Just like the scripture says, will you come into my heart and my life Will you be my Savior to forgive me? Will you be my Lord to lead me? And will you be my friend to walk with me through this life and help me to be everything that you've created me to be? And dear friend, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, the scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so we believe that you just received Christ as your Lord and Savior if you prayed that. Let me know if you did that. Just drop me a line at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I'd love to hear from you. God bless and keep looking up. <laughs>